This episode is brought to you by 3C Activation ADHD Group Coaching. I am no longer getting paralyzed or caught in this whirl of negativity that leaves me under the covers for weeks. I'm getting more done and able to stay more focused. This group has taught me to celebrate the smallest of wins, which is really a big deal. I feel proud of myself, said Nikki from 3C Activation, a group member. Struggling with emotional regulation? Stuck in feelings of stress and overwhelm that are leaving you stuck and unproductive? Apply for Adult ADHD Group 3C Activation. The link is in the show notes. See you there. Welcome to Proudly ADHD at work and in business. I am your host, Coach Kathy Rashidian, and I help professionals like you understand the science behind your unique brain so you can unlock that inner genius. Ready to transform your ADHD into your best asset? Keep listening. Welcome to another episode with Coach Kathy. Today, I have my awesome guest that has come back to to this show to talk about emotions this time. So welcome, Jeff Copper. Drum roll. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, so much for having me on. I, I'm, I'm excited. I always, like, I always like working with you. Yes, we have good conversations. So one of these days, maybe we'll do it in person. One of these days, somewhere in this <laughs> world. I'm in Canada. He's in America. We'll, we'll meet Touché. somewhere in between. Touché. Um, yeah. So let's talk about emotions and emotional regulation and all that stuff. Jeff, let's start with what is an emotion to you? What's the definition of that? Well, to me, I don't know if I want to really want to define an emotion, but I just want to talk about kind of from my perspective when I'm working with people to frame it all out so we can think of it in a way that gives us some context. And to me, is an emotion is a reflexive reaction. And, and I say reflexive reaction when you walk into the doctor's office and he hits your knee with that hammer, your leg is going to swing out unless you're expecting it and are going to inhibit it or have the ability to catch it when it happens. And one of the things that's important about ADHD is while emotions are not a part of the diagnostic criteria right now, which by the way, they were before 1968, but they were removed. The, the reason is unclear. However, we believe it was because it, emotions were difficult to, to manage. That said, Dr. Russell Barkley and others totally believe that emotions is very much a part of ADHD and are advocating that it return to the diagnostic manual. So when we think about ADHD, it's that reflexive brain, that impulsive brain. If you take a look at executive functioning, there's self-awareness and there's inhibition, the ability to restrain yourself. So in that context, we talk a lot about self-regulation. And so when you start thinking about regulating attention for ADHD, well, you also have to regulate your emotion. And today we're focusing on that side of it. So I just wanted to kind of give a context to that. And emotional self-regulation for some is not as challenging for others that I've coached. It's everything. Because when you are emotionally reacting to things, you're not thinking about things and you're, you're skipping over it. And that actually inhibits your ability to focus because of that emotion. And so that's one of the reasons why I was really grateful to come on today and talk to you with you about that, because um, it, it, it can be a real problem for people with ADHD. Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. And the way, and just to give you a different perspective also, folks, the way I was trained on it, on emotion and with the whole gamut of it is, is th th this process of our thoughts create our emotions, which then our emotions create our behavior. And if you look at any cognitive behavior therapy that, that is rooted in, in that modality as well. And for me, anytime I catch myself in those you know, big emotions and big feels, I really have to kind of pause and say, what am I thinking right now? What is fueling this intense emotion? And that's another way for me to do that check-in. Any thoughts on that, Jeff? Yeah, so I, I don't disagree with you on that. So mine is more of an analytical way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So basically, our thoughts and our experiences, like you go back and let's say, you know, you, you've taken a math test, like algebra test, 10 times and you failed it, that experience 
um, creates thoughts in your head and you have an emotion around it. And when you hear math test, right, there, to me, that becomes a reflexive reaction. One of the things I like to talk about is when we're threatened with our lives, our primitive brain goes to fight, flight, or freeze. It's a reflexive reaction that we, we run like hell, fight like hell, or play dead. And the thing about our brain is we can't tell the difference between a real life threatening event and a perceived life threatening event. So if your boss is yelling at you or your or, or a client is, or you like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job. Do you feel threatened? Your brain also can't tell the difference between a real life threatening event, a perceived life threatening event, or an anticipated life threatening event. So that's what test anxiety is, is you perceive that it's, you know, you're gonna fail the test, it's gonna create a problem. And some when you're in that emotional state, sometimes you can't even remember what you know. So mm -hmm. walking into that test is like you, you freeze and you forget what's going on, which comes to come back to your point is when you're in that emotional state, you got to pause and you got to stop and you got to think, you got to take an inventory of what's going on. And, and that piece of it is really what I think we're talking about today. How we get to that. It, it, I mean, I simplify it as a reflexive response. You're describing it in a different way, but it's that moment where that, that emotion kicks in that we got to pause and we got to do something about that because if we don't, it can lead to some, you know, you can start, you can, you know, people with ADHD are more susceptible to getting fired because of the emotional self-regulation. They just start to lose it or uh, they get frustrated in a, in, a, in a relationship or in any number of situations. And so that's a real trick. And the one thing that I know, Kathy, is of everything that I coach, emotional self-regulation, the process of what you're supposed to do is the easiest for me to describe. But by far, in my opinion, it is the most difficult for people with ADHD to execute for a few reasons. One is it's emotional. And, and when you're in the soup, it's difficult. Number two, you have to actually identify that you're in the motion. It kind of goes to your point. It's like, you got to catch yourself in that moment and take inventory of your thoughts. It's difficult enough to know that you're in that emotional state. And then when you are, you got to pause and bring your thinking brain online because your more primitive emotional reactionary brain will have you jump to conclusions. There's a lot of cognitive distortion that takes place in that emotional reaction. And, and I, as I described, you know, you could be hiking, right? And you can look down and freak out. Oh my God. And, and if you stop and your brain kicks in, you look down and realize that's not a snake, it's a stick and it's not going to threaten you. That's a way of describing how you can just look at something and have an emotional reaction, but you got to stop and you got to bring your thinking brain online and go, wait a second, it's not what I thought it was. And so anyway, coming full circle is, is what you're saying. I agree with what I'm saying. I'm agree with And I think we're really talking about that epicenter. Okay. Now that we understand that's an issue with ADHD, what do you do about it? Cause that's just really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get to the what do we do about it, I want to ask, I'm curious, because you've been doing this longer than I have. And so you, you have, you know, a slew of case studies and, and clients on this. Inattentive ADHD versus hyperactive ADHD and how they react to emotion. What I am noticing is with inattentive, it's like a retreat and go in and just shut down completely where with a hyper or combined, it, it's that like whew, bull in a China shop coming through. Like, I'm going to say it, I'm going to lay it on you. Let's keep on arguing. Let's keep on yep. producing more dopamine yep. in this argument. So have you noticed the same or what do so, you think? Yeah, I, 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 you know, we like labels because it helps us communicate. But at the same time, when we look at labels, it shuts it down. And so I want to kind of broaden your thing is, is, I don't know if it's all in attentive, but there's some people when they get that emotion, they go into, when I put in the context of fight, flight, or freeze, they go to that freeze state. And that freeze state becomes a very withdrawal and they kind of back off. Whereas others go into that fight state. They just get really, really aggressive. I have to say, I haven't really noticed it because I don't really ask if it's inattentive or not, just because, I mean, that's a DSM-4 thing. But going back to your point, yeah, some people, their, their natural reaction is to be paralyzed and go inward. And, and this is a generalization. Women have a more of a tendency to go inward and internalize it. Men and have a more more of a tendency to get more aggressive with it. And, you know, that's, that's why there's you know, ADHD manifests different in men and women. And some women, it, they just can really, really um, how do you say, it gets, it gets internalized. And that's why, I, in part, not totally, why a lot of women, particularly in their teens, they get diagnosed with depression and stuff first. Not the ADHD, because they're internalizing th those emotions. And it comes off as depression because it comes very withdrawn and very depressive light. 
so they get missed on some of that. But but to your point, people do have a tendency to to do one or the other, um, run like hell, fight like hell, or freeze, play dead, as I say. I like it. That makes sense. And for me, just just so that we're not generalizing, I am the bull in the china shop. <laughs> I go all out. So and, and I remember vividly my last corporate gig. I had a meltdown in front of my VP and 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 my other executives, and it was just it was too much emotions. I just yep. couldn't. And the work pressure, sleep deprivation, all of that added up. So let's go into then. You know, the Kathy now knows what to do. The Kathy before <laughs> was like, I'm just going to ball in front of all yep. these people. And they're all looking at me like, get it together, girl. So what are some of the things that you have found useful in, in kind of checking in? Well, let me, if I, if, if I may, mm-hmm. I want to share with you, I've studied this quite a bit. And to me, there, there's a process to this. And it's the same for everybody. They, everybody uses different words. But I'm going to start with, I did an interview with Autumn Zatani back in 2014, Autumn is in charge of the entire curriculum at Sesame Street. That includes the TV show, the app, the YouTube channel, and the website. And season 43 was dedicated to self-regulation because self-regulation is foundational in the learning process. So you have self-regulation and one part of that is emotions. So that season, what they did is they used the Muppets working with preschoolers. Now this is an ADD, but this is all, I mean, this this applies to everybody. And they would, number one, they would use the Muppets to help begin to get the, the, the preschoolers to identify and name emotions so that they could distinguish the difference between like frustration or anger or overwhelm or whatever. And they would work with them doing that. Again, the Muppets would kind of model that a little bit. And then the idea is, is like any coach is you go to the body because the body doesn't lie. The mind will, I mean, will lie to yourself to a certain extent. So you begin to feel where frustration feels or where does overwhelm feel or what does anger feel like? Because that, that physical body sensation, if we could get people to listen to that, that will cue because when you're in that emotional state, you got to know that you're emotional. And that's hard. It's not like somebody walks in, like <laughs> Lynn Coplitz is a uh, comic <laughs> and she, she has a Netflix special called We're Not Crazy, We're Hormonal. And she has this bit about like how some guy walks in and says, you know, you're crazy. You're like, what do you think? Your man <laughs> intelligence is going to get us to over? Like, that's the craziest thing you've ever done. I'm just going to, you know, you're not in emotion to hear that at that point in time. But the point really is, is you feel your body in order to know that you're in an emotional state. And then when you're in that, the first thing you do is you belly breathe. And the reason you do that is the brain needs oxygen and literally the blood is diverted away from your prefrontal cortex to other primitive parts of the brain. And the idea here is you wanna get as much oxygen into your bloodstream as you can. So what blood is getting to your prefrontal cortex, it gets there and then you wanna to count to three and this process of pausing and breathing and counting is to downregulate your emotion, as they say, to bring your thinking brain online, and then you brainstorm. Now, feel the body, catch yourself, pause, breathe, count to three, bring the brain back online. Okay, Marines or first responders, whenever there's an emergency, first thing you do is don't panic. That's the pause, right? And you stop and you think about what's going on. And like Marines, what they do is they practice over and over. Imagine storming the beach in Normandy, like the bullets are flying all over. It's a very emotional situation, but to work together as a team, they practice it over and over and over and over so that the body kind of takes over. As an athlete, I swam four hours a day for 11 years. And there's a certain amount of muscle memory that you get as a result of that. The kicker in sports, they kick and they kick and they kick and they kick and then they run onto the field. There's two seconds to go and there's a 50 yard field goal and the other team calls timeout. The reason they do that is they want the kicker to think about it. They want them to get emotional. If you ever watch the kickers, nobody talks to them and they're like kind of walk around and usually they're busy because they don't want to think. They just want to get up there and let their body do it. So going back to, to this is, is, catching yourself in the body to feel yourself, to breathe, to count, to downregulate your emotion, and then brainstorm. It's usually helpful if you do it somewhere, somebody else. Or if you're in a situation where you're first responders, you practice those things over and over and over and over and over and over so your body kind of knows what to do. Again, it's a really easy thing for us to describe, but the execution of it is really difficult. And so Melissa Orlov, she works with a lot of couples that are ADD, and they'll, she'll talk about when you feel that flooding feeling or the pit in your stomach or whatever. And so 
fundamentally, that's the process is to catch yourself, to pause, to breathe, to count to 10 and to think that's, that's, it's, it's again, different, different words, different types of things, but that's fundamental there. So what I do is I've just really, number one, to help educate people on what an emotion is. And again, it's a reflexive reaction where you got to catch the pause. And then I start to help people begin to identify and, and there's different ways of doing this. But I try to, number one, help them begin to identify those times when they're more susceptible to become an emotion. It's kind of like if you, you know, have an issue with your mother or your, your spouse in certain situations, it's like walking into the doctor's office. You know they're going to pull out the hammer and then they're going to hit your knee and you're expecting it. So you want to inhibit it when you walk in the room. Or the other one is, is what are you feeling and what are you doing to begin to catch yourself when you're in that motion? So I want to kind of pause here and, and, and get your thoughts on this before we keep going. Yeah, I, I everything you're saying, yes, yes, yes. And I, I think another piece for me when, when I do my own assessment of what's happening in my environment that I'm going to, you know, blow my lid off or whatever you want to call it. Is, is really checking the environment and and what have, have I eaten yet? Have I taken a break yet? Have I you know gotten some fresh air? Is the lighting too much in my face? Like all of those sensories also affect my emotions, especially I have a four-year-old that man, the last few days, she's been testing my emotions <laughs> and she's having her big feels, right? And it's also not only teaching her how to manage those emotions, but then myself too, as a mom to be like, okay, Kathy, just walk away, let her have her moment. And I, I set her up for it. I'm like, okay, you're going to have your freak out. Go ahead. It's okay. Then I put my hand on her chest and I do the breathing, even though she's in tantra mode, she can't, she doesn't know what I'm doing, but it's for me to do it with her. It's like, she's seeing something. And I believe in that, you know, transferring that energy to the other person, I truly believe in that. And it's, you know, one thing it was like after work with both my husband and I, we always check in on, make sure you eat before you walk into the house because anything is going to set us off yep. if we're hungry. So that for me, hunger and emotions is a big one. So that scan yep. of the environment is huge. So I want to come back to that because I think what you did a really good job from a metacognition perspective is kind of going through a checklist in your mind when you're in that state to kind of do some stuff. So, and I wanna, I wanna I really wanna, I wanna highlight that a little bit, but before we go there, one of the things about emotions is it's kind of hard to practice because you just like, an, I'm, and I'm very athletic minded and the skill of catching yourself and down regulating, it's a skill to do that and you need to develop it over a period of time. It, it doesn't come natural for everybody. And because life is live, like you don't want to practice. I mean, you'd like to execute when your boss has got an issue with you or there's a difficult situation. But one of the things that I do with my clients and I, when I like to talk about, I call them attention exercises. And they're exercises that you do to manage your attention. And to me, there's three majors. One, one is a shift of attention, a shift of attitude, but the other one is a shift of emotion. And so <clears throat> I'm going to work my way backwards. I loved the last election. I loved it. The whole Biden Trump thing was very, very, very polarizing. So for my adults that were struggling with emotional self-regulation, if you were a Trump fan, your exercise was to watch CNN news. And if you were a Biden fan, you would have to watch Fox news. And the idea was it's, it's a simulated environment, but if you were really, 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 you know, anti-Trump to sit and watch Fox News. You, and I would say, you know, when you watch this, you understand is that the news that's being there is, you know, it's, it's, it's not a threat to you. It's a simulated environment. It's, I mean, and these people would be upset. And I said, your job is to practice noticing, feel your body start to well up and then start to breathe and try to let it go. To, again, I do that. And, 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 and vice versa. And it was funny because and so, I mean, it was such a polarizing thing. I had, and it was, it was the best ever of, of, and I'll come to other exercises that I have, is that people would walk in, like, I, mean, I just can't watch it. I go, I understand you can't watch it. This is not about believing. This is an exercise, like an athlete. You're there to practice. If you can do it for five minutes before you lose, that's okay. But I want you to understand what I'm talking about when it comes to emotional self-regulation. And it was really eye-opening for some of them because I, we were able to simulate it. So that's one thing. Another thing I do is I have, if there's not a really polarizing election, is I'll have people watch like movies. Like if it's, if you're, if, if you're, 
not to be sexist or generic, but just the vernacular is a chick flick that you get emotional with or high drama. Like I actually discovered this watching uh, Star Wars 3 Return of the Sith, the end of it where who becomes Darth Vader and uh, Obi-Wan or have this battle. I'm sitting there on the floor feeling my body like getting all tense stuff. I'm like, oh my God, I re relax. And in that experience, I noticed in simulate, it was kind of funny because when I would actually totally relax, I couldn't watch the movie. When I was watching the movie, I would get back in. I began to hear the music and the sound and affected it. So these are the types of things that I encourage adults to do to kind of practice in a simulated environment and practice feeling their body and letting go, feeling their body letting go so that when they're in that moment, they can actually stop and kind of calm down. So that being said, another thing that I do is once they get that way, a lot of times I'll go back and tell me about a time when you were off the rail and you were able to calm down, you know, uncharacteristically quick. Because what I'm looking for there is something environmentally that happened that's enabling them to reset. And I've had people like one woman actually, yeah, and I forget the, the circumstances, but for some reason she had to dunk her head in a bucket of ice and it that shocked her and she calmed down. I've had people go out and run a half mile fast or doodle or play the piano or different types of things. And these are things that are individual to that person so that we're in that, that emotional state and they're trying to calm down. If you go dunk your head in a bucket of ice, Rather than taking two hours to calm down, it might do it in 20 seconds. So I try to help them find what their unique trigger is. But now when they get to that point, now they've calmed and they've got to think clearly. And now we're right, right square where you are um, before about taking an inventory. And the, the issue for you is really dependent. Yours might be very a sensory area and hunger and that type of specific because it could trigger you. For some people, it could be a flash of light. For other people, it might be the topic. It might be, I'm feeling threatened. Often people with ADHD, when they're in a relationship, these partner, Melissa Orlov talks about the symptom response response. There's a symptom like go to get eggs at the store and they come back with everything but eggs. And the partner is frustrated because they didn't get eggs and they don't know why. And they, they I'm gonna say attack. They're not really attacking the person with ADHD, but the person with ADHD feels threatened, okay? Like, and they have an emotional response. So they forget eggs. The partner has an emotional response because they don't understand what's going on. The person with ADHD now feels threatened and they have an emotional response and it starts to spin out of, out of, out of control. So. For some people with ADHD, it's I felt threatened. And the idea is you stop and you either like, was I really, really threatened? Was maybe they were trying to help me with something, or maybe I was oblivious to my ADHD and put myself in their shoes. But it's a thinking process that they're going through when they're feeling threatened. Yours might be sensory, somebody else's might be something else. But again, I want to get your thoughts on this. Again, the idea is to catch yourself of the physical type thing. What do you do to kind of downregulate? Maybe you have something that gets you there, but then there is a, a cognitive thinking process that one does to problem solve that is exceptionally important because if you don't get to that part in time, you can't think. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thoughts? I love it. And I, and that example you're talking about, the, the shopping and forgetting, which happens to me often. It, you know, part of that I think also is as adults with ADHD, we're so hard on ourselves. We have been living with this brain. For some of us who were late in life diagnosed, it's like, oh God, now I know all the things that I that went the other way before the diagnosis, I understand it. But we're carrying this weight on our shoulders. So the minute somebody says something that we already know, we effed up, we know we forgot. It's like, oh, there it is. Now you're really yep. putting it in front of my face. So, and you just happen to be right in front of my face. So let me just have at her. And yep. I'm gonna pull out all my emotions and give it to you. So, you know, th there's a book that I want to just mention here very quickly, How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. This book is intense. It, there's a whole lot of research in there on how our emotions are made. And what a couple of things she talks about, and I'm not going to go to it too, too deep because I won't do justice to it. So I encourage uh, our listeners to, you know, listen to it, read it, whatever you want to do. One of them is, is uh, when it comes to emotions, our brain has kind of compartmentalized and categorized things, you know, from childhood, from like, don't touch that snake, that snake is danger. So it kind of remembers that and it holds on to that emotion of like, if I see a snake, it's fear. If you show a snake to a two-year-old, it wants to go touch it. 
doesn't know any different. Yeah. It hasn't been taught that to be afraid of, of this. And then the other thing that she talks about is body budget. And that's where I learned that whole, what is my body budget? What have I done all day? That whole scan of my whole body of how much emotions have I gone through, good or bad. Like if I have a full day of coaching, then in the evening, I'm just kind of like done. And my emotions are like depleted and I need to recharge and recalibrate. So I'm leaving you with those yep. two thoughts. What do you think about that? I think I, I, I love it. And that launches into something else I think that we want to do is you said hard on yourself, hard on ourselves. One of the things that people with ADHD is they are hard on themselves and they are, they become very judgmental and just have to walk through the progression of this. So you understand what I'm talking about here is they become so emotional, so judgmental, and they become so hard on self that they begin to project judgment back on themselves. So what, what I mean by that is sometimes people don't even say anything. They just, their behavior is in such that, oh my God, I, they said no to the movies. They must not like me. They, you're, you begin to jump to these conclusions and you don't stop and it goes back to you not stopping and thinking, but you're, you're hard on yourself. So when somebody says they don't want to go to the movies with you, you project judgment back on yourself. They get to the point in time where they don't even ask the person to go to the movies because they're already convinced the person's going to say no. And where I'm going with this, and I think that's really, really important is in the moment that you're hard on yourself and you're projecting that judgment on yourself, the person that you might want to go to the movies with might say, well, I, I don't want to go because I just, I, I don't like horror movies, or I've got another important thing that I need to do, or, you know, I'm just, I'm really kind of not in the mood. There could be any number of reasons why they legitimately don't want to go, but that person with ADHD begins to latch on to it. And this leads in this whole rejection sensitivity type thing is because they're triggered with regard to this and they be, there's a cognitive distortion that takes place and they begin to catastrophize on this. And what, it, what it's, this is emotional self-regulation. What, one of the things that I don't like about this and th this rejection sensitivity is a big thing out there is when we name something like that and we label it, people begin to expect it and, and identify with it and they become a victim to it. And to your point, they're kind of taught to be afraid of it. And one of the things that I don't like about it is it becomes so specific. People begin to ruminate on it. And they actually make the emotion worse of it as opposed to dwelling on it. To me, the idea is really to back up and say, well, wait a second. You're just being hard on yourself because you're not thinking. You're emotionally jumping to the end. Now, sometimes you might be rejected, but I can guarantee you, you're not rejected 100% of the time for those reasons. But you are if you think you are because you don't get into that. And so in summary, emotional um, regulation is important. People with ADHD become so hard on themselves, they don't think their way through this, which leads to projecting judgment back on um, their selves. And now we have these labels like, like rejection sensitivity, which heightens it and magnifies it and people ruminate on it and actually makes the emotion more difficult and harder to override. So I just want to kind of pause. I know you have some thoughts on this. Yeah. And I really do because every time my clients come and say, okay, rejection sensitivity dysphoria, it's kicking in. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so, so we may be a little bit controversial in this conversation. There's other colleagues of ours and peers that'll say, no, it's a thing. This RSD for me and as how Jeff explained it, at the end of it, it is that it's that emotional regulation piece. And it's, you know, the mind's eye. Sometimes, you know, when, when I was diagnosed with ADHD, it was an explanation. And quickly I said, okay, that's the alphabet. Now let me yep. move on. Let me go yep. because I'm 40 something. I already have developed certain behaviors. Now I want to change certain things. So now I know what to do with it. But then there's a time where sometimes we hold on to those letters for dear life and it can cause more issues because then you keep repeating it over and over yep. and, and the mind follows the words that you say. I really believe in that whole, you know, watch what you're saying and I'll do an episode on how powerful language is. But this is it, is every time you're like, oh, my RSD is kicking in. That's really, you're kicking back into, you're, you're telling your mind to stay in that fight or flight or freeze mode yep. because I want to hold on to this, this, uh, this label. Yep. 
So it's really important to yeah. let's just debunk it. Let's just say it is at the end of the day. What are your tools yeah. to be looking yeah. for the solutions to help you pause, to regulate yourself? Another one is, is the whole mind's eye. If I say you're going to start seeing blue cars everywhere, you will start seeing blue cars everywhere. So it's the more we put our attention to something that becomes the thing. So if anything yeah. out of all of this is please yeah. our listeners pay attention to, and I know with social media, some of those, those TikTok videos on RSD, it's so validating, but then there's a point where stop watching them. Yeah, so so <laughs> at, at the end of the day, people with ADHD identify with it emotionally and emotion sell. Just go watch the social dilemma on Netflix and you'll, you're, you're drawn to that. So it sells. There's no research on the RSD thing. I give Jessica McCabe credit on how to ADHD. She has a video on she says, this is none that, but we can all identify with it. And I think going to your point, don't invite it in for tea. It's an issue. Just move on. But, but that leads to something else that I want to go to. And, and, and Kathy, you might not you might have a different opinion on this. Maybe, maybe not. And this is a perspective thing, but I'm going to take this emotion thing to another place that I see. When taken to where we are is when you label something, it's RSD. When you label something, you quit paying attention to it. Like one of the things I don't like about ADHD, we like the label to get accommodations, but when you label it, there's only one kind, right? There's everybody's the same and nobody understands the individual differences. And when you're coaching somebody, you coach the person, not the label. So going back to my original conversation about how emotions are a reflexive response and you skip over the thinking, there's a fallacy in my opinion, we can all agree to disagree, but this is just a Jeff Copperism is if you have ADHD, you're supposed to plan, prioritize, and do things. And so it's, I'm going to come up with my planner, and I'm going to schedule on Friday, I'm going to do X. Now, as I've learned over the years that 80% of procrastination is rooted in ambiguity, or you have a working memory problem. Scheduling it on Friday does not do anything to resolve the ambiguity. So what happens is people schedule it for Friday, and they don't know what to do and they don't do it so now they call themselves a procrastinator they start name calling i'm a perfectionist i'm a per procrastinator i'm lazy these are emotional responses that skip past thinking what's really going on so what i do in my stuff is when, when you're calling yourself a procrastinator that's a that's a reflexive emotional response where you're shaming yourself it's not doing anything to resolve the problem because I'm trying to get you to stop and look and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how long this is going to take. If you don't solve for that problem, you're not going to go anywhere. And so in my practice, I look at procrastination as an emotional response because you're skipping over the thinking part. You're not analytically doing this. And if you look at it and say, listen, I really don't know what to do. That's a legitimate reason why you're not doing it. So now, if we take a look at the legitimate reason, two things happen. We take the emotion out of it. Number two is now we can problem solve for what's really there as opposed to shaming yourself because you can't treat ADHD through the lens of blame and shame. So this gets to another point that I really want to emphasize. When you have ADHD, we often focus on the outcome. When you have, it's emotional, I need to do X, I need to do X, I need to do X. When you are emotional and you're dwelling on that, you're escaping from the thinking part. You're not actually thinking, what do I need to do to get there? So and too often people with ADHD are stuck because they're dwelling on the outcome. This is hard for people sometimes to conceptually understand I need to get to New York. 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 Okay, well, what, 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 what I need to do is I need to sit down and brainstorm. I can go by train. I can go by car. I can go on the internet. I can go airplane. Okay, now to actually go through the effort of thinking of all the options to getting there is a working memory issue and a thinking issue. And people with ADHD, they working is effortful. So they escape the thinking part and they just go to the emotional part because it's a lot easier. It's a lot quicker just to call yourself a procrastinator and shame yourself and then go watch Netflix because you get out of the work. And that doesn't, 
for some of you, that doesn't sound like an emotional issue, but for me, it very much is because I'm having a hard time getting my people. They, you've got to stop and you actually have to think you've got to do the work. And I know, Kathy, you've talked, you've coached through the people before, before. They always talk about how they need to think about it. They, they, all they, they think about that fact that they need to think about it, that, but they never actually sit down and actually think about it. It's like they keep kicking the can. That goes back to, we did a, a thing on working memory and working memory is challenging for people with ADHD and sitting down and thinking about it is worse. So emotions often are an escape from actually doing the thinking. I'm going to pause and get your thoughts and reactions on that. Like, bravo, standing ovation. Thank you so much for saying that so <laughs> eloquently and so systematically. I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying because, and I'm not just saying that to be nice to you, Jeff, because I would call it if it was different, <laughs> but it's true. And I always say, and it goes back to mind your language. And if, if I hear a, another term on I self-sabotage, I used to call myself that, by the way, I used to say I self-sabotage till I learned what that all was all about, which goes back to what you just said. It's the emotions that what was I avoiding? What was I not doing? Currently, real case scenario, I am sitting on an online course that I'm creating, but then I keep putting it off, keep putting it off. Why am I putting it off? What's happening here? And what's happening here is I need to be in a think tank with three other coaches that are like-minded like me so we can develop this course together. Because I've realized I don't want to do it by myself. So it wasn't that I was procrastinating is I hadn't figured out what I wanted to do with this course till the other day, actually, I was like, oh my God, I need a group of thinkers like me to sit down to do this yep. with me. So then I let go of the guilt of, I'm not doing my online course because now I know what I have to do. Yep. So, it, so that is so true. Yeah, so I wanna context here and forgive me, I'm gonna digress and come back to this for a second, but I swam in college for a guy coached Mark Spitz, one NCA six times in a row. He has his PhD in, in physics. And when I swam every Sunday morning in college, I had to swim and I was videotaped underwater from an underwater window and I was taught stroke mechanics. And in swimming, your hand is pitched into the water. It's like an airplane wing. And Bernoulli's principle applies. The way an airplane flies is imagine you have two air molecules that hit a wing at the same time. A wing is curved. If they're going to meet on the same opposite side at the same time, the one going over the top has got to go faster than the one on the bottom, and it creates space between the molecules. That's a vacuum, and it creates lift, and an airplane wing takes off. Simple concept. Well, when you swim, you pitch your hand to create lift to pull you forward in the water. So I was a master swim coach later in life, and when I'm coaching people, the idea really is I want them to swim efficiently, and I'm trying to teach them stroke mechanics because it's very important because there's so much friction in the water, and I would have different mindsets. Sometimes I would have an engineer, and I would talk about Bernoulli's principle. Oh, my God, would they eat that up, and blah, blah, blah. They would get there. Other people were more emotional, and they just couldn't deal with that. And that crowd, I'd say, okay, count your strokes. Okay, you did 26 strokes of that lap. I want you to get it down to 16. Now, I want to understand something. The end game is the same, but the cognitive thought process is different. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize here is Kathy and I have a little bit different styles, but we end up in the same place. So I'll talk to people about how procrastination is, when you say that, that's an emotional response. We're skipping over the thinking part. And if you stop and say, what am I not clear about? Then you can step by step by step get there. Kathy sometimes is, hey, I am sabotaging, whatever. And if you heard what she says, effectively, it ends up being very similar to what I'm talking about. But some people identify a lot better with the way she does it. So it doesn't make us, either one is wrong or right. It's just a different as a style. And the trick of a coach sometimes is to dial it in because I'll do a lot of Kathy stuff sometimes if I've got somebody who's like that. And I want to want to make that distinction so everybody like, listen, to these guys are different. No, we're actually kind of the same. We're just adapt this thing sometimes. And I'm purposely doing what I'm saying on here to look at emotions in a different way because most people don't talk about it the way that I do. But again, I just really wanted to validate what you're doing gets people to the same place. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely makes sense. And and you know, one one thing you said about uh, swimming and teaching it the way you're, you you coach it, I learned how to float when somebody 
explained to me the scientific way of how to float. Mm -hmm. And before that, all of my friends were like, just float, just let go. Yeah. You'll float. I'm like, it's not working. I'm sinking. God yep, dang it. Yep. Like, help me. And then this one person, and I, I cannot remember how he explained it, but I know it was factual. It was scientific yep. and something clicked. So, and I like the, the dynamic of the two of us is that it is this difference of it. And then however you want to listen to this, whichever nugget you picked up from this, you know, 40 or so minutes of a conversation, you know, take what you want. It could be one or two nuggets. It could be the whole dang thing. We could talk about this forever and ever. So Jeff, I think I like to bring it to a conclusion. What's the one last thing that you want to leave our audience with before we really leave? Well, I, I want to, I want to, at the end of the day, we've been all over the place, mm -hmm. but what the real issue is to emphasize Self, emotional self-regulation is a much bigger part of ADHD than what most people give it credit for. And we wanted to put a spotlight on it. We wanted to talk about the process. It is very, very difficult. At the end of the day, it's about catching yourself and practicing it and figuring out really what works for you because we're all individuals. But I think the goal today, Kathy, was really to put a spotlight on emotional self-regulation because when you're off the rail emotionally, you also have an attention problem because you can't focus, you can't think. And often you've got to manage the emotion first so that then you can manage attention. And I think that we did a, a reasonable job of getting people's attention. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to get on the forum and talk to you about this because, you know, I always love doing this with you. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So folks, until next time, we hope that you got some really awesome value from this. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have this riff with me. And until next time, folks, keep on shining.